board is currently in closed session and will return to open session once closed session has concluded.
The board is currently in closed session and will return to open session once closed session has concluded.
The board is currently in closed session and will return to open session once closed session has concluded.
Yeah, it's on. It's We are back in open session. I will now take roll call to confirm attendance. Please unmute your mic and respond when your name is called. Supervisor Solis. Present. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Yeah, Madam Chair. Supervisor Kuehl. Here. Supervisor Hahn. I'm here. Madam, Madam Executive Officer, please read the report of action. The following is a report of action taken in closed session on October 27, 2020. Item CS1, no reportable action was taken. CS2, no reportable action was taken. Thank you. Thank you. So now we are going to switch the order a bit. We will begin with the set item on um, public health, followed by 57J, 57H, 21, 24, 27, 57A, 57D, and finishing up with 57E. So with that, we will begin with um, the set item on um, public health. Dr. Ferrer. Checking that you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Why don't you give us um, a, a quick overview in terms of what's, what the status is? Sure. Um, so as many people have noted, um, we saw a significant increase in cases over the last couple of weeks uh, prior, uh, you know, uh, prior to the last two weeks, we were averaging between 1,000 and 1,100 cases a day. We're now much closer to averaging 1,200 cases a day. Uh, the state is releasing our new metrics uh, today on their blueprint for recovery and uh, will be placing us again in tier one. That is, of course, uh, unfortunately, the most restrictive tier and also the tier that continues to indicate that we have widespread uh, transmission of COVID-19 here in LA County. Uh, our new numbers today will post at eight cases per 100,000. That's about uh, over 800 cases a day. That's an adjusted rate. Uh, last week, the state posted this at 7.6 cases per 100,000. Our positivity rate overall also creeped up from 3.4% to 3.7%. And our equity measure, which looks at the test positivity rate in the 25% of our census tracts uh, that have the least resources to promote health, uh, we creeped up there a little bit from 5.9% to 6.2%. Uh, those metrics cover data that was collected between October 11th and October 17th. So again, there's about a 10-day lag here in terms of the state uh, making their calculations and posting them. Uh, you'll note right away that for our test positivity rate, we're actually in tier three, and for our equity measure, we're in tier two. But as I've uh, as I've said before, uh, the state places you when your metrics are in different tiers in the most restrictive tier, and that's because our case numbers indicate that we still have uh, a lot of transmission that will limit our ability um, to think about other reopenings that will be options when we get to tier two. Uh, but we remain committed to working with all the business sectors that are open today and particularly with our schools um, to make progress on both bringing students back into uh, their schools uh, for needed services and support and uh, to make sure that uh, folks are again able uh, to get back to work. Uh, as noted uh, last Friday, the health officer order was amended uh, to allow all personal care services to be opened indoors uh, as long as they were uh, taking uh, care and modifying um, their practices to do good infection control and distancing and masking. 
we opened up batting cages, uh, mini golf and go-karts uh, for outdoor operations. And again, uh, continue uh, to work with all the other sectors that are open uh, to make sure that they're able to be in compliance uh, with all of the protocols to operate with safety for both employees and for customers. I do want to note that our compliance checks over the weekend which really we're looking a lot at some of the newer sectors that open breweries and wineries also recently have reopened. Uh, we found high levels of compliance. I want to thank all our business partners um, and their staff for ensuring that they're adhering uh, to the protocols. The one area where we're going to ask for uh, additional uh, consideration is around the physical distancing requirements. That was the area that Across the board, uh, more of the businesses were struggling with. So as a reminder, you do need to, even if you're outdoors, uh, make sure that there's that six feet of spacing uh, between your tables and people do need to stay six feet apart uh, from each other. This will be especially true as folks may be going out to their favorite restaurants uh, to watch the games uh, for their favorite sports teams. Uh, so please, you know, help out, wear your face covering if you're not eating or drinking and keep your distance from other patrons uh, that may be at uh, any of the businesses that are opened right now. I do also want to note that uh, we continue to have a lot of interest in reopening schools and getting both high need students back and also bringing back some of our younger students through the waiver program, which applies for students in grades TK uh, through grades two. Uh, for the schools that are reopened uh, to provide services for high need students, uh, we currently have a well over uh, a thousand schools uh, that have reopened uh, for uh, these services. 69% uh, of the schools that have reopened are public schools, 18% are charter schools, 14% are private schools. Um, they're bringing back currently over 35,000 students and over 25,000 staff to support those students. Last week, we announced that four waivers had been approved for four elementary schools to open. They were all four were private schools. Uh, today, we'll be announcing an additional 25 schools that applied for waivers have been approved. This approval process is both approved by uh, the Department of Public Health here in LA County, but also a uh, concurrence from the state. And we'll continue to process uh, those applications uh, that have already come in for completeness. Uh, you'll note that uh, there's a, a change that's been made to the application process uh, that now allows for uh, waiver applications to be ex accepted uh, if either they're accompanied by letters of support or if in fact um, they're accompanied with an attestation that shows that there was consultation with the main stakeholders. That's parents, uh, teachers and staff, and community organizations that support the school. Highly recommended that schools continue to get letters of support. Impossible to imagine that you could open up for services uh, for students grades TK through uh, grade two without having teachers, staff, and parents uh, supporting those efforts. Again, I wanna thank uh, our school partners very high compliance. We do do technical assistance and uh, site visits at every school that's reopening. Uh, we've done about 700 to date. Um, and again, uh, really, really high compliance. Well over 90% of schools are in full compliance uh, with all of the requirements for reopening. And I want to thank uh, schools for doing that. Uh, we have started to see uh, very small numbers of cases associated as people go back into school buildings. Um, I want to note the numbers are both very small and uh, with only two exceptions, uh, there are no outbreaks. So these are basically one case or two cases uh, and no outbreaks associated with those uh, small numbers of cases to date, which is the goal of all of the safety plans that are in place. If things work well, uh, we will never stop there from being cases at schools because there's a lot of community transmission but what we're trying to stop is a lot of transmission in the schools uh, when they have their positive cases. So again, I want to note that um, I think schools are doing an excellent job. I want to thank uh, the staff and the parents. It's really up to parents to make sure that they're not sending 
uh, into school campuses any children with any symptoms of illness uh, that could be related to COVID-19. Uh, you'll create a situation where everyone will need to be quarantined uh, while we figure out whether it is COVID. So the best possible steps for parents to take is not to send children in with colds or uh, respiratory symptoms, bad headaches, bad stomach aches. Uh, this is uh, not appropriate when you're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, I wanted to also uh, talk for a second about the data challenges that we've had recently, uh, just to give people an update. Uh, the original challenge happened a couple of weeks ago uh, when the feed that we get for electronic lab reports from the state uh, did not include some of our larger labs. When the state fixed uh, their, that issue, uh, it meant that there were a lot of backlogged cases, uh, case records that were then sent to us uh, over a very short period of time. Our own system had a problem when they received all of those backlog cases uh, and in fact created some duplicate records, which meant that our team here was really going in manually to try to separate out duplicates and really ensure that we were just reporting uh, accurately on the numbers of cases that we saw. Uh, those problems have been resolved. Um, I do want to note that uh, all of our systems uh, have been taxed by the pandemic. Uh, we uh, receive information uh, that creates over 5 million records a day here and all of the processing uh, that's required for us to analyze and record that information uh, remains a, a, a huge uh, task for uh, our team here that really works around the clock uh, to process that information. Uh, but it does uh, take additional resources at this point in time to keep our systems both operational, but more importantly, uh, efficient and creating uh, much needed redundancy. Um, so, you know, appreciate uh, all of the board's support on uh, their understanding and again, apologize for the delay uh, in some of the reporting. You know, I really just close with uh, the importance as our case numbers have risen uh, in the last two weeks, the importance of each one of us uh, remembering to do our part. There's really no substitute for the all in, uh, you know, mentality that's needed uh, for us to make progress uh, in slowing the spread. You know, every single person doing their part, wearing your masks, keeping your distance, not gathering uh, with others that aren't uh, in your household unless absolutely necessary, and then adhering to the gathering guidance that has that limited to being outside, masked and distanced, and only with two other households. Uh, you know, that's the path forward, uh, especially for helping us uh, reduce transmission enough that we can start thinking about bringing back uh, more of our students uh, into our schools. With that, uh, supervisors, I'm happy to take any questions. I also want to thank all the board members uh, for their leadership and support. It, it's been, uh, I know, uh, you know, uh, extraordinarily challenging, but I don't know that this county uh, would have made the progress it's made without your leadership. So much appreciated, and uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Ferrer. And I just have to say, I'm encouraged to hear that there has been high compliance in the sectors that we've reopened and that allowing businesses to return to the operations has been a primary source of increases in the cases. So I, I think it's important that we, or has not been a primary source of increases in the cases. I think it's important for us to acknowledge those that are actually complying and recognizing that um, as we open, it doesn't mean that they go back to business as usual. So I think it's important for um, the compliance to be highlighted and actually to be enforced. I know I've got something out in the Acton Agua Dulce area where you've got a menu that is not being compliant, is having large parties and is blatantly um, ignoring the public health orders. And I'm hoping um, that anyone listening, um, you know, I feel we should hold accountable those that are also booking at those uh, venues because they know the rules about large gatherings. But having said that, county council is working um, to get that closed. I know we're issuing certificates, but they're they're thumbing their nose at that and think it's cheaper to pay the $1,000 than it is to comply um, with the health order. Um, I want to reiterate a, a point that you made about remaining vigilant. Um, I understand that our communities have now been in safer at home for seven months, and it's unreasonable to expect them not to engage in some level of social activities, but it's important for them, and you've given clear outline in terms of what can and cannot be done. 
And so I want to make sure that people recognize, even with the, the baseball and all, um, it's important to not gather in, with, in, in large groups and to keep the social activities to a, a limit. Um, that was the purpose behind the governor releasing the direction for small gatherings. And I want to encourage all our residents to heed this guidance when interacting with friends and family and stay distance when outside as much as possible. The one thing I want to ask, and I know Supervisor Solis is probably going to bring it up as well, is when we authorize the card rooms, there's also off-site betting. Um, I know the Antelope Valley Fairgrounds has approached my office, um, satellite betting, and I know that the state has allowed that. So all I would ask, and I think you're going to come back at the end of the week with some sort of um, language that would allow off-site uh, satellite betting to uh, or to have the county align with the state's public health order as it relates to that. And that, that's really all I would ask. So yeah, with no. that, I just, I just again want to thank you, Dr. Ferrer. Um, you know, we appreciate the work that you're doing and, and Dr. Davis. And Supervisor Solis, you wanted to say something. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ferrer and Dr. Davis and doc, uh, Dr. Galley, the entire staff, your team for working with us so closely. And, you know, it, it's uh, heartbreaking that we see around the country uh, COVID cases increasing uh, the way that they are. And I know that we've gone through our, our own uh, tribulations here. Uh, I'm glad that we've clarified at least the, the backlog in terms of data that we were receiving. I, I know that we're going to be able to, that will be rectified if it hasn't already, and we're going to just keep moving forward. Uh, and we are still uh, in the most restrictive tier, and we do have to be vigilant and continue to, to do our very best. Otherwise, we can't open accordingly. Um, and I do want to say that I'm glad that Supervisor <clears throat> Barger brought up the satellite wagering because I do do think that um, if we can move forward on that and align ourselves with the state, I think that would be fine. It's outdoors. It can also, uh, I think, uh, you know, we can impose those restrictions that we have with other industries and I think uh, that will help provide um, at least some economic relief to, to some of those industries. The other item I wanted to raise also was with respect to farmers market, markets, which we, we have spoken about before, and hope, hopefully your, your team will be able to, to come up with some uh, idea there and how we can allow for small uh, minority-owned uh, businesses that typically <clears throat> work in this area and most are people of color that we can provide some assistance in some way or at least come up with something that is amenable and safe. So I look forward to hearing uh, from you on that. Um, and I also just want to ask a question, uh, Dr. Ferrer, uh, regarding uh, where are we seeing most COVID-19 outbreaks? Where, what are they, you know, what are they stemming from? And what about any workplace compliance uh, relative to what we saw a couple couple of months ago? Are we in a better trajectory, or where are we with those with those two uh, questions? Yeah, and um, thanks so much uh, for both for both questions, Supervisor Solis, and, and also for your leadership. Um, in terms of farmers markets, here yeah, we're checking uh, why there's confusion. Our understanding is that. Uh, farmers markets are permitted to um, both sell, you know, produce and uh, and uh, food, uh, but also prepared foods at this point in time. And if that's not clear in our guidance, uh, we will go ahead and, and make some changes um, so that, you know, people all understand that, you know, uh, again, these are permitted uh, facilities are and, and operators are able to, in fact, as you noted, uh, participate fully in the farmers markets and and we know lots of people uh, depend on being able to purchase uh, at the farmers markets as well from the vendors and in fact uh, it's always better to be uh, doing your business on purchasing outdoors than it is indoors um, so we're going to work closely with the farmer farmers markets and, and clear that up as quickly as possible in terms of outbreaks you know we continue to see outbreaks you know across the county and all of the different sectors uh, that are open, um, you know, as we've noted before, manufacturing remains, uh, manufacturing and warehousing remain uh, sites uh, where we see the larger um, outbreaks. Um, and again, uh, you know, this uh, also occurs in all kinds of different businesses, uh, food processing uh, businesses and food uh, distribution businesses also are places where oftentimes um, there's more overcrowding and less adherence 
mm -hmm. uh, to some of the basic infection control protocols. Uh, as you noted, whenever there are three or more cases that happen over 14 days at any work site, we call that an outbreak. Uh, right now, we have over 400 active investigations across the county uh, where uh, there are outbreaks um, uh, that are happening at work sites. Um, so our teams will visit those work sites and our teams will work with both the employees and the employers, uh, not only to get everybody in compliance uh, with the rules about how you need to open with safety, but also to make sure that there's uh, appropriate contact tracing and, and that everyone has access to testing that they need uh, to determine who in fact is positive and really try to contain the spread of uh, positive cases within a work site. Uh, but thanks for those questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, so I, I kind of wanted to uh, maybe kind of lump my questions together, Dr. Farrar, and then you can answer them. Um, so first one is, I know that we um, have increased the um, percentage of the uh, students that have the most need to be in person from 10% to 25%. So my question would be, how long would you recommend that we wait to see what type of impact that has on our uh, cases before we made another adjustment? That's number one. Um, and, and part of that is, have you looked at other data from other counties across the state in terms of their school reopenings and kind of what impact that had? Because that was the most important thing to us was getting our schools open. So now we want to see you know, uh, if that was a good decision or not. Um, number two, so um, I know we really want to get to the red tier, which is less restrictive than the purple tier, which we're in now. And um, we're a ways from that because our cases are going in the wrong direction. But maybe just could you say, do you think we're ever gonna get to the red tier? Maybe when are we going to get there? And would you uh, recommend that once we get to the red tier, we just um, automatically align ourselves with what the state allows? Or will you be um, maybe looking at some uh, more restrictions since it's LA County? And then the last thing I wanted to ask about was testing. Um, you know, I'm frustrated with the with the data that we get and I know the public's frustrated too Mondays it doesn't really count because there's a lag time from uh, Saturday and Sunday and then we had some technology glitches which kind of messed up our uh, reporting so I think that we're all looking for you know that number that's under 800 uh, that's what we're all praying for uh, so when the numbers come in kind of skewed or they don't really count or they've all got an asterisk by them, I think the, fr the public gets frustrated. So maybe you could just touch on, um, do you think there is in our future the kind of test that doesn't need to go to the lab that I don't even know what it's called, uh, but it's rapid testing, but it doesn't need to go to a lab for verification. People can tell right there whether they're uh, positive. And we know the biggest thing about that is we need to get these people quarantined, right? If you test positive, you need to get quarantined. That's part of the problem. And um, the, now I forgot. Okay, one was schools. Two was uh, when we get to the red tier, how do you uh, envision that for LA County? And three, the testing. And boy, <laughs> we would sure also like to know where these outbreaks, or, or not even the outbreaks, but where are people still getting this virus? Is it these backyard parties? Is it, what is it? And how can we really uh, clamp down on these backyard parties? I'm going to be celebrating tonight for the Dodgers, you know, on my couch in my house, and it won't be any less exciting or satisfying. But what are we doing to, to knock out these 30, 40 people backyard parties. Okay, that was a lot. Okay. Take it away, yeah. take it away, Barbara. <laughs> okay, and, thank and, you so and much. And try to, to be tight with your with your answers. Uh, thank I'm you. Fine. Yes, thank you so much. And and thank you so much, Supervisor Hahn, also for all your support and leadership. So I'm just gonna take them in order. 
Um, yes, we did increase uh, the number of students that can be on campuses to 25% of the total student body. That means about 350,000 students uh, in the public school system uh, would be able to be back on campuses. Um, can we go higher than that 25% of, of bringing back students of high need? No, we cannot, not in tier one. Uh, that's the cap by the state. Uh, so the highest we can go is to get uh, about 25 Five percent of all of our students uh, back onto their campuses if they have high needs that cannot be supported through virtual learning. Uh, we are doing our very best, as, as you know, to uh, really work very closely with the schools and track very closely what's happening at the schools. Uh, we have outbreak management teams and we have technical assistance teams uh, that work daily with the schools and both you know, provide assistance, but also it gives us a really rich database uh, to look at to assess how well we're doing. I mean, the first test is can, can schools come in compliance with the directives? And so far, that's a resounding yes. Uh, the second test is can we make sure that we don't have a lot of outbreaks? We know we have high positivity in our communities and lots of transmission, so we're going to see cases at the schools. So the second test for all of us is when we have cases, are we doing enough in the schools to make sure there's not a lot of transmission? and that's in part has to do with the cohorting of students, that in part has to do with infection control, and that in part has to do with distancing and masking. Um, so we're able to look at that data, and I think it's gonna tell us a lot, and it tells us a lot in a very short period of time. Uh, my sense is uh, by the time we get to the red tier, and yes, we will get to red, uh, by the time we get there, we'll have really good information about what's needed to be done for it to be as safe as possible when students, staff, and teachers uh, return back to schools. Um, and I appreciate everyone's, I feel like what's really working here is that everyone's working together. Parents are working really hard to make sure that they're doing their part, taking care of their children, making sure their children go to school with their masks and not with their colds. Teachers and obviously staff uh, and administrators keeping our school buildings safe uh, for everyone and making sure that the rules make sense in the way that uh, it's easy for people to follow. So I feel very optimistic uh, that if we continue to do things well and, uh, and make these really what are enormous investments uh, in people's time and energy on creating these safer environments at schools, we're on a path that will allow us to be able to open many schools for many students with as much safety as possible. That being said, um, I want to acknowledge there are many parents uh, for a variety of very good reasons uh, will not be able to or will not want to send their children to school at this point in time in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and they too need to have options of uh, being able to remain at home and have their children uh, with the ad academically enriching and supportive environment that will allow them to thrive uh, while they remain at home. So that the, the jobs for the schools are enormous in meeting all of the, the various needs during the pandemic. Uh, again, I want to salute and thank uh, everybody who's working at schools to make this possible. Um, yes, as I noted, we will get to the red tier. I think we're three to four weeks away uh, because of how it works. Uh, you have to have your data uh, meet the thresholds for the red tier for two weeks before you can move. Uh, the, day, the state is a little behind, and we know last week we continued to see an increase in cases, so unlikely uh, that the clock will start ticking for us next week. Uh, but I do know, uh, and maybe uh, this sort of aligns with your last question, uh, I do know that uh, we have the tools at hand to slow the spread and to slow it more significantly than we are now. The truth of the matter is, and we've noted this before, uh, those informal gatherings that, you know, are relatively small but large enough to have a lot of spread of the virus are at this point what's probably contributing the most to the increase. Uh, we all love to cheer on our teams. I do also. I think as Supervisor Han noted, uh, there's safer ways to do that than to hold a party. And oftentimes it's not even in the backyard. It's in your house in front of the TV with your buddies and uh, nobody's wearing a mask and people are screaming and yelling. Uh, and there's a high likelihood that people uh, in that group uh, may in fact, uh, you may have one person who's infected, asymptomatic and spreading the virus. So we need to stop thinking that just because we know people, they can't be infected. Everybody can be infected. 
you know, all good people, all people who are doing everything they can to not get infected, still are getting infected. So we ask everyone, don't have those gatherings, especially don't have them indoors. And the limit is on two other households, outdoors only, with masks and with distancing. Um, and I think uh, that will absolutely help us then, you know, get to red and get to red more quickly. Um, I think uh, when we do get to red, uh, there are a lot more options uh, about what we can uh, reopen. Um, and really, uh, in many of these, it's less about what can be reopened and more the conditions and the modifications that are going to be required. So, for example, at shopping malls, you can move from 25 percent uh, maximum occupancy to 50 percent when we get to tier two. Um, you can open your museums for indoor operations at 25 percent of occupancy. Uh, places of worship, movie theaters, and restaurants, uh, again, can open for indoor operations. The limit there is either 25 percent or 100 people, whichever is less. And fitness centers could go back inside uh, at 10 percent of occupancy. Uh, for us, uh, the big uh, the big issue we're going to face when we get to tier two is we have to do it uh, the reopenings in a way that doesn't push us back to tier one because that happens. Uh, we saw it in one of our counties to the south. Uh, they reopened; they were in tier two, and then a couple of weeks later, they were told they had to move back to tier one. Uh, we don't want that to happen, so I think you're likely to hear from us that we do enough sequencing of the reopening. Uh, that we're able to support all of the various sectors as they uh, go back inside so that they do it in a way uh, that really does fully adhere to the directives and we don't create for ourse ourselves situations where we're having more community transmission that takes us right back uh, to tier one. Um, I'll move on to the last uh, question I think you raised that I didn't touch upon, which is testing. Um, and sort of the frustration with the delays we have when tests get reported, when we finally tell the public because we're sure that we have accurate results. Uh, what is that? What is antigen testing? Which is, I think, what you're talking about, Supervisor. Antigen testing is what we, you know, people are talking about rapid testing. Many of uh, these tests do not require a lot of sophisticated uh, labs to process the test results. Um, the big issue with antigen testing, because it holds so much promise for us, uh, it tends to be much less expensive, and, and as you noted, you can get results within 15, 20 minutes. The issue for us is right now those tests are uh, approved through an emergency authorization uh, to only be used uh, for people who are symptomatic, uh, because that's where they have determined that they are fairly accurate in the results that they give us. Uh, right now, uh, as we announced earlier this week, um, we are part of a, a group that is studying our ability to use that same antigen test, that same rapid test, uh, to be able to use it with asymptomatic people, which is where we uh, want to all use it, uh, to be able to use it with asymptomatic people and feel pretty comfortable that the results that we get are accurate and reliable. So, But we do need to do a little research there so that uh, before we sort of have everyone using an antigen test, uh, we know for sure that it's giving us fairly reliable results. It's not giving us a lot of you know, false negatives or false positives. So that study is uh, happening right now, and it's happening in other parts of the country as well. I think as, we, as long as we get good information back fairly quickly, that holds, as you noted, a lot of promise. Uh, we will have to make sure that people who test positive uh, understand uh, that they need to work with us, that they're, corn that they're isolating and we're helping them with their close contacts. But it, does, uh, it is a game changer when we can use rapid testing that's relatively inexpensive and it can be done much more frequently. Right, and that's the, that's what we're doing right now with USC, the city of LA, and the county, correct? That, yes, that's exactly okay. the study that we Got announced. It. I think you announced it this morning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that, and they're in the second week of collecting data. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions? All right. So, uh, Dr. Fur, thank you, and we look forward to um, to getting something by the end of the week regarding the modification of the existing health orders. Yes, we will. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So item S1 is before us. I will move and second by Supervisor Hahn to receive and file the report. 
If there are no objections, that will be the order. Okay, now we are going to go on to um, Supervisor Ridley Thomas has requested that item number 27 be heard, then 57J, and then 57H. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, colleagues, this motion um, co authored by uh, the Honorable Janice K. Hahn asked the county to rethink our approach to public safety on our medical campuses. Uh, I want to thank the many individuals and employees that weighed in to s express their support. Uh, uh, the incident at Harbor UCLA on October the 6th, in which a sheriff's deputy uh, shot uh, a psychiatric patient many times is um, uh, quite uh, concerning. Uh, some argue beyond troubling, and there must be um, uh, a swift, uh, thoughtful, and fair investigation uh, by uh, the designated entity, namely the Office of the Inspector General, to ensure accountability as we move forward. And unfortunately, instead of welcoming this investigation, uh, uh, there has been resistance uh, uh, to the OIG's investigation uh, and the appeal of the uh, medical staff uh, of the same, uh, therefore necessitating uh, this board to make it our prerogative to ensure that an investigation occurs. But colleagues, uh, this incident where an officer uh, has shot a patient on a medical campus, campus is not isolated. Others preceded it, uh, and it forces us to pose the question about the role of uh, armed law enforcement uh, on medical campuses, which are intended to be focused on wellness and healing. Uh, this work is timely, and I trust that the uh, team from the health department, the chief executive office, and county council will come forward with sound policy and uh, the appropriate legal guidance on how we can best approach this moving forward. Uh, some will recall that a similar a uh, request was made um, uh, several years back um, in terms of an incident that took place at the same uh, medical uh, uh, facility um, and uh, the Department of Health Services has sought to uh, implement protocols. This then warrants uh, deepening, expanding, strengthening uh, the way in which the culture of uh, the medical center at its best can be appreciated by all. Um, this is um, uh, uh, an attempt to get to best practices, moving this agenda forward in a manner that puts well-being of patients, of visitors, of uh, the staff itself at the uh, medical center uh, first. Uh, Madam uh, Chair, uh, thank you for the opportunity to express uh, these uh, points of view in this regard. Uh, and I uh, turn the floor back to you for the co-author to be heard. Thank you. We're going to let the co-author, Supervisor Hahn, speak, and then Supervisor Solis and Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, for inviting me to co-author this motion with you. Um, this one I can support. Uh, since we read in this motion at the last board meeting, my office has continued to hear from medical students, medical professionals, staff, former patients at our county medical campuses about the urgent need to rethink what safety looks like in a hospital. Bottom line is hospitals are places of care. We need to create an environment of compassion and healing for everyone inside, whether they're dealing with a physical illness, a mental illness, or supporting a loved one. And what I've heard over the last few weeks and just now during public comment earlier is that the constant presence of armed officers makes it very hard to create this type of calm and supportive environment. Just a few weeks ago, this board passed a motion also authored by you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, and me, to reimagine public safety in our parks. And so this motion builds on that one by asking that we also reimagine public safety in our hospitals. Safety is and always has been a priority of this board, but safety looks different in different environments. 
Hospitals are unique places that require unique approaches to public safety. So this motion today is asking that we re-examine what that approach looks like. Thanks to everyone who's contacted our office and everyone who called in today to share their stories. We hear you and we're committed to continuing to create an LA County that is safe for everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Thank you, Supervisor Solis, and then Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to thank uh, the authors of the motion, Supervisor Thomas and Hahn, for bringing this forward to us today. We continue to see law enforcement use excessive force, including lethal force against people with serious mental illness on our streets, in the jails, and in places where people seek care or are receiving care in our hospitals. People with mental illness who are experiencing a crisis require a different type of engagement from people who are trained in how to interact, talk, and understand the person who's exhibiting these behaviors as a result of a trigger. Meeting this behavior with lethal force is not how the situation can be de-escalated and only creates other problems. What occurred at Harbor UCLA is unfortunate, and it's not unique to this hospital, but we know what occurs in other medical campuses as well. I support having the Inspector General investigate the incident, but also ask that he work with DHS to establish a process to review incidents involving law enforcement and their engagement with patients in our other county hospitals. I also look forward to the report back with recommendations on the alternatives rather than the status quo law enforcement responses to how we engage with people with severe mental illness and mental health needs when they are experiencing an episode or a crisis. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Kuehl. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I um, support this motion very strongly, but also support 57J and 57H because I think uh, unlike the comments of my previous colleagues uh, and I agree with them as far as they go this is not disconnected from other aspects of violence by the sheriff's department and to say that parks and hospitals require different de-escalation techniques and perhaps the use of different professionals is true in those environments, but I think is also true in other environments. And I think this should be seen in the context of the use of force and uh, firing uh, and wounding and killing of civilians by this sheriff's department and what it means really about the leadership. Uh, for instance, between 2013 and 2018, there was a steady downward trend in deputy-involved shootings. And this is a shooting, uh, though it took place in a hospital, it is a shooting by a deputy. And the downward trend went from 44 to 22. Last year, the numbers went up again to 28 for the whole year. And this year, we've got 26 and still two months to go. There have been 23 deputy-involved shootings in just in the five months since George Floyd was murdered. So the information is disturbing on its face, but um, you know it requires, I think, a broader action. For uh, in the context of item 27, though, I strongly uh, uh, support and thank Supervisor Riley Thomas and Supervisor Hahn for bringing this motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And you know, last but not least, I'll just say that I, I am supportive of this item, and I think it's important for us to gather all the facts. I, I do believe there are two sides to every story and I want to better understand what took place here because it was not long ago that we actually put security in because we had a tragic incident in LA County USC um, where uh, someone came into the emergency room and shots were fired. So I think it's important for us to take a balanced approach. I completely agree when you're working with the mentally ill especially, um, there has to be practices in place recognizing that um, that you know, we've got on the outside the mental evaluation teams, and I think we should be duplicating things like that on the inside to ensure that our patients are not put in harm's way. And so I, I look forward to getting the report and understanding um, where we can align with best practices and, and truly protect not only our patients, but also the people working in our hospitals. 
So with that, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, do you have any closing comments on this item? Uh, no, Madam Chair. Thank you for your um, taking the item up, and I uh, move the agenda. Okay. This item is moved by Supervisor Ridley Thomas, seconded by Supervisor Hahn. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 27 is before you. Supervisor Solis. Yes. Marissa Solis, aye. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Aye. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, aye. Supervisor Kill. Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, Hahn, aye. Motion carries five to zero. Thank you. Now we will move on to 57J. Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Body-worn cameras are uh, a vital tool in enhancing the transparency and in accountability for the actions of sheriff's deputies. They serve as an impartial uh, reporter uh, to the actions of law enforcement. Uh, it took us quite a while to get them implemented uh, in the county of Los Angeles, but finally uh, they are here. And in the case uh, that is a tragic case of Fred Williams, um, proximate to uh, a park in the second district, um, namely Mona Park, um, illustrates um, what must happen and how we must move forward. It emphasizes the unique perspective that uh, body-worn cameras can bring to bear. Uh, LASD leadership uh, has um, uh, denied county oversight bodies legal uh, those legal requests to obtain and preserve uh, that footage. Uh, oversight of investigations into fatal uses uh, of law of force by law enforcement is legally mandated under state law, Madam Chair and colleagues, obstruction of oversight and in, uh, inquiries into uh, use of forced uh, deaths and the department's troubling history of mishandling administrative uh, investigation reasonably suggests that this footage should not remain solely um, with LASD. Uh, the preservation of this footage is critical to rebuilding the public's confidence, and I want to underscore public's confidence in uh, this sheriff's department and policing agencies generally, without uh, which law enforcement cannot do its job of making communities safe. Uh, the board has remained committed to bringing transparency uh, to the conduct of law enforcement personnel, and uh, this case is no different. And, and a thorough investigation, including a review of the footage from uh, the body-worn camera of the deputy involved uh, shooting, uh, fatal shooting, I should add, of Fred Williams is imperative for community healing. This is about the larger agenda of um, trauma-informed work. This is about the Department of Public Health and its violence prevention and trauma-related uh, work treatment and intervention strategies. Uh, and so our agenda is comprehensive. It is seeking uh, to make our communities better. And I simply want to say um, I would urge our adoption of that which is before us and uh, 57J, Madam Chair, and I want to thank you. And I look forward to the board continuing to demand uh, transparency and accountability and ultimately healing for both our communities uh, and, might I say, the department itself. Madam Chair. Thank you. I see no, let me, uh, Supervisor Solis. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas, for bringing this motion before us. You know, it angers me that we continue to see only the killings of black and brown people in LA County, but the need for a follow-up motion to ensure that an investigation oh. conducted by the sheriff be transparent and requiring an independent investigation by the Inspector General. But here we are. Before I begin my re remarks, though, I want to extend my sympathies to the family of Fred Williams. I stand with you in your pursuit of the truth about your son's death. You deserve the truth. You deserve answers. But let me say you should not be dealing with your son's death. This is a parent's worst nightmare. And I lend my support to the Williams family and Supervisor Relief 
Thomas's motion in having the chief medical examiner conduct an immediate inquest into Fred's death. We have no confidence in the sheriff who is not able to inspect and investigate on his own. Um, additionally, given the sheriff's previous history on how he engages, or should I say not collaborate with the inspector general, I look forward to the report back about alternative plans to ensure an independent investigation is conducted on how Fred was killed. Again, I want to send my um, condolences to the family and I hope that we can look forward to more transparency as we move ahead on the part of the sheriff. Uh, and I fully support the Office of Inspector General um, and hope that we can get to the truth. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing no one else request to speak, this item is before us. Moved by Supervisor Ridley Thomas, seconded by Supervisor Solis. Madam Executive Officer, please call the roll. Item 57J is before you, Supervisor Solis. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas? Aye. Supervisor Kill? Aye. Supervisor Kill? Aye. Supervisor Hahn? I mean, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Motion carries 5 to 0. Thank you. We are now going to move on to item 57H regarding options for the It was held by Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm fully aware of the, uh, the significance and the weightiness of this matter uh, and the extent to which uh, some members feel like they haven't had sufficient opportunity to uh, weigh it, uh, assess it, uh, and land uh, pursuant to the fact that it was on a green sheet. Uh, which uh, may not have uh, caused uh, enough uh, time to fully work through this. Um, I think the board has demonstrated uh, the consensus it, that it has built around reform. Uh, the board has uh, been able to, uh, one motion after the next, uh, communicate uh, to our respective constituencies and publics that we uh, stand firm in terms of the issue of a transparency and accountability. I only think it reasonable uh, for uh, the board to have the opportunity uh, to look at this matter uh, with the amount of uh, clarity and confidence uh, that makes each board member uh, comfortable. Therefore, I'm going to continue this item pursuant to uh, an acknowledgement on part of the members of the board that uh, more opportunity may be needed. And so we will take it up, Madam Chair, with your permission at the next scheduled, uh, regularly scheduled meeting of the board so as to afford every member the opportunity that they wish to have uh, to uh, study this issue more carefully. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, then this item will be continued, but understand that I, I still stand by my belief that um, the sheriff is elected and that in 2022, unless there's a community of effort to vacate that seat prior to that, um, that that's where the voters have a right. And I think it's important for us to recognize um, that policy, but I look forward to discussing this um, again in two weeks. Madam Chair? Oh, yeah. As well uh, after the motion, since you made a- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Supervisor Kuehl, go ahead. Uh, Thank you so much. I, I was um, I agree, obviously, with continuing it. But since you made a statement, um, I simply wanted to say that I hope that uh, each of my colleagues will look into the fact that uh, it's very unusual in the state of California to elect the head of a law enforcement agency. Um, this is uh, in the Constitution. Obviously, if it were to be changed, that is part of this exploration is what it might take. But there are other things in this motion that I hope uh, all my colleagues will uh, look at because there are some very interesting concepts still again being explored. One as to whether it would behoove us in our municipal role, that is for the unincorporated areas, to emulate our cities that have law enforcement agencies and adopt a kind of municipal policing approach, a county police force uh, whose head we would hire, and then we would not have 
this option or this um, requirement of begging the sheriff every time to do the right thing without any way of uh, really holding him accountable. Even the Los Angeles Times today opined that there was no ability to hold the sheriff accountable just because there's an election every four years. Um, so I think this is an incredibly interesting and important motion. I hope people will, and their staffs, uh, will research um, the ways in which we might look into changing that um, uh, approach uh, and to look at all of the ways in which virtually every other government handles law enforcement except for the 58 counties uh, and whether that might be a better way to go for accountability, for transparency, and frankly, for our own responsibility to protect our uh, constituents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. This item is continued to November 10th. That will be the order. We'll move on now to item number 21, empowerment program to address the digital divide in underserved communities. It was held by Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. A few months ago, Director Selwyn Hollins of our Internal Services Department approached me with an idea he had to take youth from underserved communities and have them shadow county employees to learn IT skills. They would then use those skills to work with small businesses in their communities to create websites and build a social media profile to better serve their customers. You know, immediately I thought, yes, we have to do this because it could provide the small mom and pop businesses with the lifeline to survive this pandemic. But Selwyn has envisioned so much more. His department, ISD, is responsible for county IT services, and it's also the county's purchasing agent for our contracts. And those two roles make it the perfect spot, in my opinion, for a program to engage our corporate partners who we contract with to provide the resources and, more importantly, the opportunities for establishing apprenticeships in their companies for the youth who participate in the program. The motion calls for a work group of departments to come together to shape an implementation plan. I'm really excited to see what the work group can come up with, and I want to recognize Director <clears throat> Selwyn Hollins for his initiative, his deep understanding of the true needs of our communities, and for providing a pathway to empowerment for our young people. So colleagues, I ask respectfully for your I vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Lisa. I, I appreciate being able to co-author this motion with you. I think this is vital moving forward. And again, I, I know as a board, we're united on the fact that this really has highlighted the digital divide, especially in LA County and underserved communities. And we're talking about learning and distant learning. I think it, it's, it's imperative um, that we work to ensure that those that are most vulnerable, both from an education, but also from a health standpoint, are receiving the services that they um, deserve and need. So I'm proud to be a, a, a support, or a co-author with this. And I, I also want to acknowledge ISD and, and the work that someone's done. He is um, working hard. And I know he recognizes that um, we've got to get this done and we've got to get it done as quickly as possible. So thank you very much. Do any of my colleagues, anyone else want to speak? Hearing nobody, moved by Supervisor Solis. Seconded by supervisor, by, by myself, to approve this item. Madam Executive Officer, please take the roll. Item 21 is before you. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas? Supervisor Riley Thomas? Supervisor Kiel? Aye. Supervisor Kiel? Aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Now we will move on to item 24, um, alignment with the LA County USC Restorative Care Village and General Hospital. And Supervisor Solis, I'm gonna let you take over as chair for a moment. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues and Madam Chair. You know, the historic uh, Los Angeles County General Hospital opened its door doors to the public back in 1993 and served as one of the largest safety nets in the most vulnerable for the most vulnerable county residents. And following the 1994 
Northridge earthquake, the county committed to reconstructing a replacement hospital, now known as the LAC USC Medical Center campus. Today, LAC USC Medical Center is a 600 bed inpatient hospital and is also widely known as the county's flagship hospital. And as a result of the opening of the LAC USC Medical Center in 2008, the general hospital, as you know, is now largely vacant and there is no direct patient care services at the hospital. And we can't make significant alterations or demolish the building because of its historical listing. So to be consistent with the general hospital's history and mission, the county has instead initiated two large-scale initiatives known as the Restorative Care Village and the General Hospital Reuse Project. Both initiatives are significant regional efforts to address homelessness, mental health, substance abuse, and affordable housing, and at the same time creating local clean green jobs and a range of critical public services for people experiencing homelessness and increasing the pool of mixed-use housing, particularly low-income and affordable housing. You've heard it from me before, but the investments into the restorative care village are worth it. And it'll help build capacity to shelter people experiencing homelessness and provide the services on site in a regional manner. The investment in the general hospital will address the lack of affordable and low-income housing and be a primary contributor to the county's homeless crisis. There's no question in my mind that these investments are needed now more than ever. And that's why this motion directs our Sacramento office to advocate $500 million over multiple fiscal years for the county's reuse initiatives at LAC USC with appropriations of $70 million for the restorative care village and $70 million for the adaptive reuse of the general hospital building in fiscal year 2021 and 22. I look forward to working with the state to further these exemplary projects. And I also, uh, are there any other supervisors who would like to speak on this item? Okay, hearing none, uh, then I would like to move this item, uh, seconded by um, Supervisor Barger. Um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Hello? Celia? Sorry about that. Item 24 is before before you. Supervisor Billy Thomas? Supervisor Billy Thomas? Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hunt, aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Uh, Madam Chair, I don't know whether the uh, chair was present and you called upon her as a second. So just to make it um, we could table okay, it. I, I would be recorded as a second if that's okay. Oh, thank you. That, that, thank you. We'll take that Supervisor Kill as the second. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Supervisor Kill. Motion carries. Okay. Motion carries three to zero. Very good. Okay, thank you. Uh, next item, members, is 57A, uh, and that is uh, Supervisor Kuehl. Uh Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I um, simply wanted to call attention to, uh, not so much to the motion, of which I'm proud, of course, but uh, to the situation that we're talking about. Uh, LA's increasingly unaffordable housing market, uh, and now, of course, paired with a huge uh, COVID-19 related economic downturn, has created a really a perfect storm for struggling renters, with tens of thousands of households facing evictions, many, many of them, increasingly more families with children. So this board has taken pretty significant steps over the past seven months with the creation of the eviction moratoria and our eviction defense program, uh, Stay Housed LA, to create protections for those very vulnerable residents. But at the same time, we have to ensure that we have the strongest homeless services system possible in place to help keep people in their homes and help those who have fallen into homelessness get back into their homes, especially our families, and that's what this motion's about. So I'm very grateful to my colleagues for considering this motion to help strengthen our homeless 
services system for our families at such a critical time. And I ask for your support. Thank, Thank you, you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, are there any members that would like to be recognized to speak on this item? Okay, hearing none, um, it's been moved by Supervisor Q, seconded by myself, Solis. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. The item 57A is before you. Supervisor Willie Thomas. Supervisor Kuehl? Aye. Supervisor Kuehl, aye. Supervisor Hahn? Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger? Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Supervisor Solis? Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Motion carries, four to zero. So now we are on item number 57A. D. I'm sorry, 57, which one? D. 57D. That's my item, Madam Chair. Okay, Supervisor Solis. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Back in May of 2018, the Trump administration enacted, in my opinion, a cruel policy to prosecute undocumented immigrants detained while trying to cross the U.S.-Mexican border. This painful and harmful separation of more than 2,500 children from their parents while their parents were in detention awaiting the outcome of their immigration cases. The Trump administration abandoned their cruel policy, but the trauma and harm persists. In fact, just last week, we learned that 545 children remain separated from their parents in spite of efforts by law firms and the ACLU. They can't locate their parents. This is yet another horror perpetrated by the administration as an assault on our values. The pain of being separated from parents is devastating, inhumane, and a human rights violation. The long-term separation further aggravates these families' suffering and stifles their recovery. In fact, the only way to begin recovery is by reuniting these families as soon as possible. This county has taken a clear stand in opposition to the separation of children from their parents. And with this motion before us, we demand that separated children be expeditiously reunited with their parents and families. Specifically, the motion does three things. It directs the executive the chief executive officer to send a five signature letter to the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security, the secretary of Department of Health and Human Services, and the Senate and House leadership, and the Los Angeles congressional delegation, denouncing the administration's policies and efforts that separate children from their parents, and to expeditiously reunite separated children with their parents. It also directs the executive director of the Office of Immigrant Affairs to investigate if it's possible to find out whether any separated children live in LA County and what support services they and their families may need. And it directs the Office of Immigrant Affairs to convene a work group composed of appropriate stakeholders to collaborate in reuniting the separated children with their parents and families and to make available county wraparound services to the children, their parents, sponsors, and families. I want to thank personally the Office of Immigrant Affairs for doing what they can to help reunite these families, many of whom may have connections right here in LA County. Staying silent is not an option. As the largest county and the county made whole by its immigrant community, we're obligated to act. This motion does exactly that. Families belong together. I ask for your I vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I strongly support this motion. Um, you know, we've seen so many cruelties um, come out of the present administration and his staff all the way down to those who are carrying them out uh, that it's often difficult not to be sort of fatigued. You know, here's another one and here's another one and here's another one. So I'm really proud of this board and thank you, Supervisor Solis, that we continue to speak up for what is right against the cruelty against the madness actually um and i think it's extremely important that we do so uh all the way up to where to the day when this administration is replaced so i uh, thank you again supervisor solis and i support this motion thank you and i also thank you supervisor solis for bringing in this motion and I'm going to join my colleagues in supporting it. Um, I, I, of course, have said it before and I'll say it again. This issue 
among many as it relates to our immigration policies illustrates the need for long-term bipartisan immigration reform at the federal level. These issues keep resurfacing and at a local level, we uh, take action in order to protect those that are the most vulnerable. And I believe this is an, a, a classic example of it, even with children that are being smuggled over here um, by no fault of their own uh, and, and being used um, during the situation. So I wholeheartedly support this and I think that we need to aggressively pursue um, long-term solutions to problems like this. So I'm, I'm happy to support this motion. Seeing no one else has requested to speak on it, it'll be moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Holt. Madam Executive Officer, please take the roll. Item 57D is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas. Supervisor Riley Thomas. Supervisor Kuehl. Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries four to zero. So now we've got uh, one last item, 57E, which is the equitable incentivizing permanent support of housing in Los Angeles County, which was held by Supervisor Solis. No. 57E, uh, yes. Madam Chair, yeah, this is on the DPH data backlog. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, yes, so I wanted to make some slight changes to the first directive of the motion. Uh, so I'd like to read those in with the revisions. The motion would read as follows, Madam Chair. I therefore move that the Board of Supervisors authorize the Director of Internal Services Department, ISD, as the county's purchasing agent to exceed the annual delegated authority for service contracts and issue purchase orders in consultation with the Department of Public Health in amounts not to exceed $135,000 with Enterprise Vision Technologies, technologies to continue to support enhancements to public health COVID data processing infrastructure and not to exceed $90,000 with Accenture for the automation of COVID data entry tasks to address data backlogs. The purchase orders will be processed by ISD in accordance with the county's purchasing policies and procedures for sole source purchases. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Seeing no one else has requested to speak on this item, the motion with an amendment is before us. Moved by Supervisor Solis, seconded by Supervisor Hahn. Madam Executive Officer, please take the roll. 57E as amended is before you, Supervisor Solis. Aye. Supervisor Solis, aye. Supervisor Riley Thomas. Supervisor Kill. Aye. Supervisor Kill, aye. Supervisor Hahn. Aye. Supervisor Hahn, aye. Supervisor Barger. Aye. Supervisor Barger, aye. Motion carries four to zero. Great. We have no specials under item 58, so we are going to move to adjournments. At this time, to be appropriate to hear adjournments, we'll begin with Supervisor Kuehl. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Kent Wakeford, uh, cinematographer best known for his work on Martin Scorsese's films, Mean Streets, and Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. His career took shape in the early 1950s when he returned to LA from uh, military service and over the next two decades, traversed a myriad of genre in both film and television, art house, feature, animation, commercial, founding one of the top commercial production companies in the US, Wakeford Orloff Productions. He also filmed social impact documentaries in South America with Willard Van Dyke with support from the Rockefeller Foundation. He is survived by his children, Catherine, who spells her name the same as yours, Madam Chair, uh, Christian, and Kent. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Stephen Solomon, who received his BA and his JD at UCLA and became one of California's foremost administrative law attorneys and an expert in tribal gaming law. He was managing partner of the law firm Solomon Saltzman and Jameson. He also was the Emmy Award winning co-creator and co-host of a popular food show called Cheap Eats and also served as a judge pro tem for the LA Superior Courts. He survived by his wife Ellen and his sons Tony, Robert and Logan. And I move that when we adjourn today we adjourn in memory of Don Nelson, a proud Bruin, 
graduating with a BA in math in 1948, had a successful 42-year career as an accountant, and among many career honors, served as president of the California Society of CPAs in 1983, and was given the Society's 1990 Distinguished Service Award. Throughout his life, he served on many boards and committees for organizations including Pacific Homes, the Multiple Sclerosis Society, the Methodist Hospital of Southern California, St. John's Hospital, Charles Drew Medical Center, the Josephson Institute of Ethics, and so many more. Along with his wife, Rosalind, he volunteered for Meals on Wheels, drove for Angel's Flight, and hosted foreign exchange students attending UCLA. He also served as treasurer and president of the Westwood Village Rotary Club. He's survived by his wife, Rosalind, and his daughters, Linda and Adelaide. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Samuel Goldfarb, who uh, served in the Army during World War II, was honorably discharged in 1946, and because of college credits that he earned while in the military, graduated from UCLA that year. After graduation, he became a CPA and joined a good friend from UCLA, Sanford Garfield, in an accounting partnership. He enrolled in the Loyola Law School night program and became an attorney in 1956. Nine years later, he founded the law firm of Goldfarb, Sturman, and Averbach, practicing in the field of business and tax. He proudly served as chairman of the United Jewish Federation Fund campaign for the San Fernando Valley and as a board member and the financial secretary of Adat Ari El, where he was a member from 1966. He was a judge pro tem in the Superior Courts and also a court-appointed family law mediator. He was also politically active, a delegate to the California State Democratic Conventions and to the Democratic National Convention in 2000 and again in 2008. He was also an elected member of the LA County Democratic Central Committee. He's survived by his children, Deborah, Nancy, and Benjamin. And I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of a wonderful actress, Rhonda Fleming, who died on October 15th. Uh, she was always kind of called the queen of Technicolor because she appeared in so many films uh, in the early days of Technicolor, and her red hair was particularly uh, attentive getting. Uh, but she was active in films all through the 40s and 50s, her first major role was in Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound. Uh, went on to appear in films like Adventure Island, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, The Golden Hawk, Tropic Zone, and The Gunfight at the OK Corral. And I'm going to... Sorry? Can, can I join that as well, uh, Supervisor? Of course. Chair? Yeah, I, I love Rhonda Fleming, the, the flaming <laughs> redhead. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. <laughs> yes, Looked they, nothing like the two of us, Hilda, but still. Oh, she was, big fans. she was a great actress, though. I mean, she really was, really yeah. was. Thank I you. I just saw Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's oh, Court the other day again. Yeah. She was just great. <laughs> anyway, I move that, I also move when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Ronald Lee Davis, who was a highly respected figure as a professor of fine arts and design at Santa Monica College, chairman of the SMC Arts Department leader of SMC's art mentor program, commissioner of the Santa Monica Arts Commission, and board member of the Craft and Folk Art Museum in LA. His remarkable life included early involvement with the musical Hair, and also as a designer of the original Gap logo. He was a brilliant instructor, a demanding and compassionate mentor, who continuously sparked his students' artistic aspirations and guided young art students to realize their full capacity. He retired from Santa Monica College in 2018 after 28 years of service. He survived, survived by his brothers Arnold, Stevie, and Bobby. And finally, uh, Madam Chair, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of businessman and philanthropist, Lodrick Cook, who spent 39 years at ARCO, started in 56 as a management trainee, and became CEO. He carried on the tradition of civic leadership established by his predecessor, Robert Anderson. In 1986, when an arsonist's fire severely damaged our LA uh, Central Library, he joined then Mayor Tom Bradley in leading Save the Books, 
a campaign to raise money for the library's restoration and ultimately raised $10 million. He was the first chairman of the Library Foundation of Los Angeles, chairman of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation, and a board member and trustee of the George Bush Presidential Library Foundation. He survived by his five children. Thank you, Madam Chair. Those are my adjournments. So can, I, can I, may I be on that um, uh, adjournment for Lord Cook? Yeah. Yes, of course. Oh, I think all members. I'd like to be on that one, too. Yeah. All right, good. All members, please. He was a friend. He was a friend. Thank you. He's yeah. a wonderful man. Excellent. Thank you. Supervisor Hahn. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Nicholas Carranza. Nicholas passed away. He was only six years old um, after a battle with brain cancer. Nicholas lived in North Long Beach with his family. His curiosity for space drew him to wanting to someday become an astronaut. Nicholas was brave. He fought until the very end with a smile and heart filled with hope. He survived by his mother, Wendy, his grandmother, Christina, and his brother, Mason. Our prayers are with the family at this very tough time. Uh, I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Debbie Walmer, who passed away at the age of 83. She was a longtime Manhattan Beach resident, South Bay community leader, philanthropist, and a member of American Martyrs Catholic Church. She was known as a force of nature. When someone was in need, she would find a way to help. More than 46 years ago, she started the Sophisticated Snoops annual home tour, which raised over $2.5 million for American Martyrs School. She became, she became involved in Sandpipers, a nonprofit organization, where she served as president and was honored as Sandpiper of the Year. Volleyball was a big part of her family's life, and after the passing of her husband and another lifelong friend, the families founded the Barry Bob Invitational Beach Volleyball Tournament. Debbie was a dedicated, generous, selfless, and loving mother and grandmother who will be missed very much. She is survived by her five children, Tim, Doug, Kim, Mark, and Chris, and eight grandchildren. I also move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Mark Fosnoff, who was 44 when he passed away. Mark was raised in Lomita and attended Narbonne High School. During his childhood years, he could always be found at Lomita Park. He participated in the many athletic leagues, and if he was not at practice or a game, he was at the park hanging out with friends or park staff. In 1992, he began working for the city of Lomita as a part-time recreation leader for the Parks and Recreation Department, and then later moved to a full-time position as a recreation supervisor. Mark was known for being caring and patient with the participants in the sports program. He was not just a coach, but a mentor and a friend to so many. Mark enjoyed playing basketball, golf, cribbage, and was a huge Lakers and Miami Dolphins fan. He loved being with family and friends, but the most important part of his life was his wife and children. He always made sure they spent lots of time together as a family to make lasting memories. Mark is survived by his wife, Kelly, daughters, Naomi, Sophie, Imori, his son, Mason, his parents, Georgiana and Arvid, and his sister, Georgette. He was the heart of Lomita Park and will be forever missed. And finally, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in the memory of Paul Connolly, who was in 79 when he passed away. Paul was born in San Francisco, graduated from St. Ignatius High School. He then went on to earn a degree in urban planning from, from Cal State University Pomona. He had a distinguished career working for the city of Redondo Beach for 28 years. He started as a planning assistant, worked his way up to the position of chief of planning. He later served as the city manager. He was known to use a common sense approach along with his calming personality to assist both the city staff and the residents of Redondo Beach to help them understand the rationale for the tough decisions that were made. He retired in 1997. He enjoyed playing uh, sailing, and sports cards. I knew Paul when I was a member of the North Redondo Beach Rotary um, sometime in the 90s, I think, and uh, he was a member of that club, and so I got to know him well. He survived by his wife, Gail, daughters, Christina, Paula, and Elizabeth, 
and grandchildren Gunnar, Gage, Gail, Hannah, Skylar, Halameda, Joseph, and Maisie. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Supervisor Hahn. I move that when we adjourn today, we do so in memory of Ingrid Chapman, an Antelope Valley resident who recently passed away after a battle with Parkinson's disease at the age of 73. After graduating from UCLA, Ingrid served as a road manager and communications liaison for comedian Phyllis Diller for 20 years. In 2001, she started Chapman Communications with her brother, Robert Vanderstock. Ingrid was a source director for the Children's Center of the Antelope Valley and chair of its annual Heart Sound Gala. In 2006, she helped put on the Welcome Home Parade in Lancaster, thanking veteran or Vietnam veterans. She was a co-founder of the inaugural Women's Conference of the Antelope Valley. She was also active in various organizations, including the Antelope Valley Board of Trade, the Lancaster West Rotary Club, Zona International, the Advisory Committee for Mental Health of America of Los Angeles, and the Antelope Valley Chamber of Commerce. Ingrid was named one of the 2013 Women of the Year by the Los Angeles County Commission for Women. Ingrid is survived by her husband, Gary, brother, Robert, and sister, Monique Leroy. Also that we adjourn in memory of William McIntyre Dolan, a longtime resident of Castaic, who recently passed away at the age of 78. He served in the United States Marine Corps from 1960 to 1964. He later served as a police officer with the Los Angeles Police Department and retired in 1999 after 34 years of dedicated public service. Bill is survived by his wife, Sue, of 55 years, his daughter, Deborah, his son, William, and siblings, Sally, Daryl, and Terry. Also that we adjourn in memory of Landy Johnson III, a longtime resident of Altadena, who recently passed away at the age of 82. He proudly served in the United States Army, where he attained the rank of specialist. After his military service, he worked as an orderly at a local hospital, where he ultimately became an administrator in the purchasing department. More recently, he worked as Weedax neighborhood worker at the Altadena Senior Center. He was active in local veterans organizations and upon retirement, served as a member of the Board of Friends of the Altadena Senior Center. Landy is survived by his wife, Nanemi, son Kevin, and his grandchildren. Also, that we adjourn in memory of Joyce Washington, a former assistant director of WEDAX, who recently passed away on October 17th. Joyce worked for the county for 46 years, where she worked for the DA's office, DPSS, and WEDAX, where she ultimately served as an assistant director in the administrative branch, retiring in 2018. During her tenure, she helped spearhead administrative reorganizations efforts at WEDAX. She received numerous recognitions, including the Quality and Productivity Award, Welfare Reform Appreciation Award, and the DPSS Shining Star Award. She had a lasting impact on the many people she served. Her son, Eddie Jr., followed in her footsteps and is currently works, working for ISD. Joyce is survived by her husband, Eddie Washington Sr., her children, Eddie Jr., and Mimi, her mother, nine grandchildren, and 10 siblings. And last, I move that the Board of Supervisors adjourn in memory of the following individuals who were identified as indigent veterans by the Los Angeles County Medical Examiner and were subsequently buried with dignity and honor at Riverside National Cemetery this month. Charles Eugene Ackles, Army, John Michael Bonus, Navy, David Wayne Brooks, Army, Jack, Jack Clark Jr., Navy, Diana Clover, Clovery, Army, David Allen Deppner, Army, Daryl Lee Eckert, Army, James Joseph Gibbons, Army, James Colburn Marshman, Marine Corps, Grover Lawrence Page, Navy, Peter Palumbo, Navy, David Sims, Navy, Leonard Smith, Navy, Robert Martin Sirks, Army, Joseph Baez, Army, Charles Brown Vincent, Army. May their contributions and sacrifices in service to our country never be forgotten. Supervisor Ridley, or Supervisor Solis. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Ustolia Santos. Ustolia Santos was born on November 13, 1929, in La Junta, Colorado, to a family of farm workers. In 1959, she moved to Echo Park with her children. While living in Echo Park, she worked in a furniture store in Hollywood and was able to meet many famous actors. A few years later, in 1964, she and her children moved to the unincorporated part of Bassett, 
where she would live for the rest of her life. To help support her family, she worked in many factory jobs in the San Gabriel Valley until she was able to land a job as a bilingual teacher's aide for the Baldwin Park Unified School District. Although Eustolia did not have the training to be a bilingual teacher's aide, she was able to overcome these challenges and become a beloved aide. She loved working as a teacher's aide and was able to make long-lasting connections with the students that she helped. Eustolia retired from the Baldwin Park Unified School District after working there for 13 years. Ustolia passed away at the age of 91 due to COVID-19. Ustolia will be remembered for her kindness and selflessness. She's survived by her children, Laura Santos, who's a Mount San Antonio College trustee, and Patrick Santos, Don Santos, and Virginia Corral, and her multiple grandchildren and great-grandchildren, who will miss her dearly. Secondly, I move that we adjourn today in the memory of Aurelio Jose Barrera. Mr. Barrera was a longtime photographer for the Los Angeles Times. For his groundbreaking work on the overlooked Latino communities in Los Angeles, he won a Pulitzer Prize. He produced a 22-part series to tell the stories of Latinos in Los Angeles. He examined Latinos in the arts, politics, religion, culture, and education, all through the lens of uplifting Latino voices and stories. He was a relentless storyteller, and his work changed the way Latino stories are told. When he retired, Mr. Barrera spent his time with his grandkids and delivered food to people experiencing homelessness in his communities. He survived by his wife, Lorena, four children, and three great-grandchildren. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes my adjournment. Thank you, Supervisor Ridley Thomas. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I move that as we adjourn today, we adjourn the memory of Hazel Ishimoto Dunbar. Uh, Ms. Dunbar was born on April 18th, 1934, in Compton, California, and recently passed at the age of 86. She grew up in the city of Gardena and throughout her life uh, called herself a Gardena girl, quote unquote. Uh, after graduating from Gardena High School, Ms. Dunbar enrolled at the University of California, Los Angeles, graduating in 1955. She was an elementary school teacher with the uh, LA Unified School District and taught uh, for some 17 years before transitioning uh, to the Youth Services um, uh, Selection Unit as its regional director, a position she held until her retirement in 1991. Ms. Dunbar also served on the Los Angeles Olympics uh, Organizing Committee in 19 from 1981 on, where she developed uh, youth activities for students, organized uh, and organized free transportation uh, to the 1984 Olympics. Uh, and that was for more than 100,000 youth and seniors uh, in uh, the 11 Western states. After her retirement, uh, Ms. Dunbar returned to part-time work at the West Youth Services Selection Office until 2004. She was passionate about music as well as a, vocal, <clears throat> a vocalist. Ms. Dunbar was a member of the Jester Harrison Metropolitan Choir and the Los Angeles Master Chorale. Uh, she served UCLA Stevens House as a treasurer and was the president of the affiliates of UCLA. She will be remembered as a talented vocalist for her travels to 48 states and for her love for her niece and nephews. She is survived by um, her niece, Amber, her four nephews, Aaron, Brandon, Gregory, and Ronald, a host of extended family and friends who will all miss her uh, most assuredly. Additionally, Madam uh, Chair and colleagues, I move that when we adjourn Today we're joined in memory of Elaine M. Fukumoto, born February 12, 1961, and passed on October 19 in Torrance at the age of 59. She serves as, served as a library page um, in, the, uh, in 1977 at the Gardena Mamie uh, Deer uh, Library and was promoted to library aid position a few years later. Ms. Fukumoto attended the University of California, Los Angeles, where she received a bachelor's uh, degree uh, 
1984, and later her master's degree in Library and Information Sciences in 1988. She accepted a library position at the Manhattan Beach Library shortly thereafter, and in 2001, she became the community library manager um, and uh, served the community for some 19 years. She was a faithful supporter of, of the Susan G. Komen Foundation of the St. Jude Children's Hospital and the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. She will be remembered for her generous nature as a mentor to her colleagues and as a dedicated county librarian. She is survived by uh, her parents, uh, three siblings, uh, and extended family, friends, and colleagues who will miss Elaine M. Ukumoto. <clears throat> Madam Chair, I move that when we adjourn today, we adjourn in memory of Paul, Pauline M. Roscoe, born on May 22nd, 1933 at Gates County, North Carolina, and passed on October the 14th in Waterbury, Connecticut. At the age of 87, she grew up in North Carolina and graduated from T.S. Cooper High School in 1952. After marrying Dennis M. Roscoe, Sr. in 1955, they relocated to Waterbury, Connecticut, where she worked at the Uniroyal for more than 20 years. She later joined the St. Mary's Hospital as a dietary aide, where she worked for 10 years. She was an active member of the Zion Baptist Church, where uh, she served as a pastor's aide and on the Missionary Society. Ms. Roscoe will be remembered for her delicious baking, her appreciation of gospel music, uh, and inspirational programs, her deep faith and love for spending time with her family. She is survived by her three daughters, Hope, Veronica, and Jacqueline. Um, and uh, Jacqueline happens to be an assistant deputy in my office. Her son, uh, Dennis, her brother, and uh, a whole range of family, friends, and grandchildren um, who will certainly miss Pauline M. Roscoe. Finally, Madam Chair, uh, I'd ask that we uh, adjourn in memory today of Gail Garner Roski. Uh, Gail Roski was born on September the 11th, 1941, and passed away peacefully in her art studio at her home in Toluca Lake at the age of 79. She grew up in Hancock Park and graduated from the Buckley School before enrolling at the University of Southern California to major in fine arts. It was at USC where she met uh, Edward, Edward Roski Jr. and they were married shortly thereafter. Um, uh, after Edward was discharged from serving in the, his, serving his country as a U.S. Marine, they settled into Luku Lake. Gail Roski focused on raising her family and after her youngest child moved out of the family home, it was then that she pursued her dream of becoming an artist. Her vibrant watercolor paintings were regularly uh, displayed in the Autry Museum's annual Masters of the Western of the American West Art Exhibition and in the California Art Club's annual Gold Medal Exhibition. She was an active member of the Los Angeles County Arts Commission and she was also one who served as the chair of the Fine Arts and Furnishing Committee uh, for the Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels. She will be remembered as an artist, a philanthropist, an avid world traveler from where uh, she received much artistic inspiration, but above all for her love and caring for her family. Uh, she is survived by her husband of 58 years, uh, Edward, two daughters, Katrina and Rian, a son, Edward III, eight grandchildren, and I should simply say a grateful community, um, an extended family and friend, artists and non-artists alike, who will miss Gil 
Roski most assuredly. Madam Chair. Do we have all members on that motion, mm -hmm. if that would be okay? On yes. The, uh, uh, yeah, I would, all yes. members. I think, yes, please. please. So that would be all members. So with that, um, <clears throat> thank you. We'll take all motions as seconded. If there's no objection to unanimous vote, that will be the action. Madam Executive Officer, you want to read something in? Yes. A Supervisor Willie Thomas would like to be recorded as I vote for the following items, 21, 24, 57A, 57D, and 57E. Okay. The record will reflect Supervisor Ridley Thomas is an I vote on those items. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. That, thank you. That concludes today's meeting. The next meeting of the Board of Supervisors will be a special closed session on Wednesday, November 4th, 2020. The next regular meeting of the Board will be held on November 10th, 2020. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye-bye. This meeting is no longer being recorded.